Coming up on Transformers University, we're about to reach the finish line, the final three episode story arc of the original Transformers cartoon. We're talking the rebirth right now on Transformers University. Hello, my friend, and welcome to episode 103 of Transformers University. I am your host, Anthony Brutali, owner, operator, madman behind TFU.info, the tour archive, the website, the this podcast, TFU News and Views podcast, and oh, so much more. And I want to welcome you to our coverage of season four of the original Transformers cartoon. Not only season four, the final season, but the final three episodes. How does that work, you ask? Well, I could explain it to you, but let's hear from the writer of these three episodes. This from a DVD bonus feature for season four of the original series. This is David Wise on being approached to write the rebirth. Somebody called me up. I don't think it was Jay. I don't know who it was. It was somebody at Sunbow and I can't remember who now. Sorry, whoever you were. And said, we're doing uh, a five-parter Transformers uh, and we want you to write it. And it's going to be, the whole season is just going to be this five-parter. Yeah, five-parter. And I wrote the story outline and I turned it into Sunbow of the whole five-parter. And they called back and they said, we love it. It's great. Everything's wonderful. We've had a budget cut back. It's a three-parter. <laughs> and I went, you've got to be freaking kidding me. A three-parter. But this batch of episodes intended to be a five-parter. And if it was a five-parter, that would have put the show at its conclusion, assuming those were the last five episodes, at exactly 100 episodes plus the movie. With this being broken down to a three-parter, that means there were 98 episodes of the original series. If you count the movie and its re-airs as a five-parter, that brings it up to 103 episodes, which, if you've been listening to Transformers University, this is episode 103. I'm not entirely sure I planned it that way uh, because I did insert an episode uh, shortly in between <laughs> what I currently had for 101 and 102. In my business, that's what we call a happy accident. So today we are covering season four, episodes one, two, three, overall episodes 96 through 98, and potentially episodes 101 through 103, depending on how you count it. Now, much like the return of Optimus Prime, there was a gap between the airing of uh, the end of season three and the beginning of season four. And once again, especially where I grew up in New York City, uh, the airtime, the broadcast time for Transformers had changed uh, once again from afternoons to mornings. So the original air date for this series was November 9th, 10th, and 11th of 1987. And from what I could find from Google's archive of New York Magazine, uh, the show aired at 7 a.m., 7 a.m. in November during a school year. I'm pretty sure I saw part one and part three live. Uh, that's my memory. I feel like I missed part two or most of part two in its original airing. Um, but that was one of those things like I got up usually around seven uh, to get ready for school. So uh, I would normally just get up and, and head into the shower and, 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 and go off to school. And I'm wondering... Sometimes I would pop the TV on, especially because my sister would get up uh, before I would, and she would uh, get the bathroom first. And like most older sisters in their teenage years, uh, they tend to take a lot longer in the bathroom uh, than you do. <laughs> At least that was always my experience. I may have just been waiting for my sister and popped the TV on and been like, huh, this is Transformers on TV. Oh my God, there's the Headmaster characters that I've seen in the comics and had a few toys of. I'd I had Brainstorm and I had Hardhead uh, for sure. And um, I met, probably remember being incredibly enamored with the episode. Uh, and and But the early time makes me think I might have missed part two and then remembered I missed part two and deliberately got up early to watch part three. So let's 
get into these episodes. Let's dive into part one. And as always, let's talk about season four, episode one, overall episode 96, Rebirth Part One by David Wise. And it starts with a new opening theme song. Now, uh, the music is the same as season three, but the opening animation is a mix of commercial animations, uh, ones used from the commercials that we've talked about here on the show, uh, and some stuff left over from the season three opener. So the animation quality of the opening sequence is actually far better than the animation quality within the three episodes. And the episode kicks off with Goldbug and the Technobots on guard duty uh, in the base. And they're talking about how there's uh, no Decepticons around in ages, uh, basically since the return of Optimus Prime. And it's nice they reference the end of season three in this. And it's also cool to see Goldbug carrying on uh, in his new body. Uh, we get uh, Scattershot, and he sees Decepticons on the radar, and they're coming right for us. It's coming right for us. Elsewhere, Ultra Magnus is checking on Optimus Prime, who appears to be recovering from some sort of, like, fall or seizure or something. Uh, apparently, he has a, a bad feeling, and uh, he is also weirdly miscolored. He has these strange bits of gray on him, his backpack, uh, the center of his forehead. It's almost like, I wonder if... If Acom, the animation company that did this one, uh, though they're noted for having a lot of mistakes in their animation, I almost wonder if they were deliberately trying to make him look older now that the Matrix was emptied uh, at the end of season three. Um, I don't know. And maybe by making some of his parts gray, they did that. That said, it's not that much further into the future. Uh, it, I really just chalk it up as an animation error, but it is still kind of neat. And Goldbug pops up on the computer screen. Optimus Prime! We got every Decepticon in the known universe heading right down our throats! So the Autobots head outside, and we get a quick conversation between the Throttlebots. Decepticons? Yeah, you know, Rulebar, big ugly guys made of metal. Who wanna melt us all down into scrap? I know who they are. I just wonder what they're up to. After we get outside, you can ask them. And this is one of the challenges David Wise ran into in creating this episode. Not only did he need to introduce 50 new characters, as we chronicled last episode, uh, in speaking roles, but he also had to promote various other characters. The Aerial Bots, the Protector Bots, the Combaticons, the, the Terracons. Everyone had to be showcased in some way, uh, and the new characters in particular need to be showcased in some way. So there's a lot of group stuff. There's a lot of... Uh, semi roll calls in this and you know how i love roll calls and they're they're littered throughout these three episodes and um david wise explains exactly what he needed to do and i did some very quick math in, in my head and i said you know if we brought these with with all the different characters we have to introduce the new transformer characters to introduce if we brought them out <clears throat> like sequentially we would be bringing on a new character it's something like every 28 seconds i mean literally it was somewhere between 30 and 90 seconds i forget exactly i have to redo the math but it was it was ridiculous so they said just bring them on in gangs just bring on you know all 12 at once and all 12 at once and which is what we wound up doing so the decepticons attack we meet ape face and snapdragon and of course mind wipe your circuits are under my power light speed you will back away And, you know, because he's Mind Wipe, you know, he has mind control powers. Uh, the sequence uh, is basically all the new Decepticon uh, characters who would become Headmasters and Target Masters versus the uh, Throttlebots and Technobots. And I think there's some Terracons uh, peppered in there as well. Inside of Autobot City, the Decepticon clones have found a way in. Punch, the Autobot spy, who we are meeting for the first time, turns into Counter Punch, uh, the spy version of Punch. Uh, as a Decepticon. Now, uh, the clones, they raid this safe that is within Autobot City, and it has a lock on it that looks like the steering wheel to a pirate ship. Um, and as we get a close-up of Wingspan uh, cracking the safe, there's a neat touch in that the Eagle um, heat sticker, the, it's like a rub sign that's on the toy's chest that lets you tell which one is which in robot mode. Uh, Pounce has a puma on his, and Wingspan has the, the bird, the Eagle, on his. This is actually drawn on his chest in the animation, and it is a really, really cool touch. 
in that close up. And in fact, last episode in episode 102, uh, which was a very special video edition, if you haven't caught it yet, go to the YouTube channel, youtube.com slash TFU info and check it out. It's only four minutes, uh, but I, I did a video version of that last Meet the Cast episode and I used that shot of Wingspan in there. So you can take a look and you can see it drawn on his chest if you don't want to hunt down the episode. Um, Counterpunch sees them steps into the doorway and delivers this classic line from the episode. Fine, you deal with my Autobot counterpart. I've heard he's nearby. Real nearby. Now, you might not pick it up here with the audio, but the humor in this scene is that Counterpunch walks in, says, my Autobot counterpart is nearby, then steps behind the doorframe, and transforms into Punch and says real nearby. Um, it's almost comedic that the Decepticon clones didn't figure this out when he stepped in. Or maybe they did. Who knows? But in that scene, Punch then steps in, into uh, the chamber there and fights the clones and loses. Uh, and they steal uh, a key from this vault. So the vault was locked with a key inside of it. So it was a lock for something that locks something else or unlocks something else. And the Decepticons have the key and they split the scene. And that Decepticon ship, it heads to Cybertron. We find out that Optimus then will find Punch, realize that the key is stolen, and decides to get everyone to Cybertron on the quick. On Cybertron, Blur and Hot Rod are racing. And Hot Rod wins uh, with Daniel driving. Brainstorm observes the benefit of a human partner could be an advantage. And Cup and Crosshairs discuss. It might give us the edge if the Decepticons did return. That's not going to happen. Cup, highbrow. The Decepticons are heading your way. How many of them, Prime? All of them. Of course, I have been wrong on one or two occasions. Now, Optimus Prime explains to Cup and Ultra Magnus about the plasma energy chamber, the place that the key that was stolen unlocks. Cup, Galvatron stolen the key to the plasma energy chamber. Now what? It's a storage chamber, 12 levels below generator C. May I ask why everyone's going to such trouble over this thing? The plasma energy chamber is the foundry in which the original Autobots' bodies were forged millions of years ago. Since then, every Autobot leader has been charged with guarding the key with his life. Just then, the Decepticons arrive. The Aerobots come out to defend, and Galvatron unleashes Six Shot. Six Shot! Show them what a one robot army is! He ends up taking out each aerial bot in a specific mode. So he uses his tank mode to take out air raid, his animal griffin flying tiger mode to take out fire flight, his car mode to shoot down slingshot, his jet mode to take out skydive, and with the help of Cyclonus, his upside down submarine mode to take out Silverbolt. Scourge then heads uh, underground, and the Autobots notice this and hop on a shuttle to follow him because he's going 12 levels below generator C. What's 12 levels below Generator C? Well, the Plasma Energy Chamber. And he finds this there, opens it, and overloads it. As it's overloading, the Autobots get the key and decide to flee. And as they're fleeing, their ship gets hit with a bolt of Plasma Energy. And that takes us to commercial. So going to commercial, we get new bumpers for season four as well. Now, uh, they don't change break to break or episode to episode. So we only get two new bumpers, one going out to commercial, and that is Scorponok, and one coming in from commercial, and that is Highbrow. Uh, and back from the break, the Autobot shuttle is hurtling through space, uh, no control because it's been overloaded by the plasma energy chamber. Uh, Cyclonus and Galvatron and company find Scourge and revive him. Uh, and Galvatron? Yeah, he's busy being Galvatron. So you let the Autobots beat you? I let nobody beat me. It was the energy from that blasted chamber. It overloaded me, then hit the ship. That plasma energy's lethal. It nearly killed me. You will follow them. You will get the key and you will destroy them. Now, the Autobot shuttle, it's still hurtling through space, but they finally gain control. But before they can, they're headed towards a planet and they crash on this planet. Uh, their ship explodes, but everyone gets out safely. 
Uh, while they're on this planet, they're spotted by a bunch of little green men who are scared of machines and this group called the Hive. The Decepticons realize that the Autobot shuttle has left a trail and decide to follow it. And as the Autobots are walking around this strange planet, he remembers the story. You know, this reminds me of the time my platoon was stranded on Regulan 4. There we were, only 700 of us against three whole Regulan metal mongers. 700 of you? Against three of them? Ah, come on, cop. You ever seen a Regulan metal monger, lad? Uh, no. Trust me, we were outnumbered. Now, you know, it's funny. I, I like cop stories because they do add depth and dimension to this world uh, and i feel like the regulan metal mongers and i haven't looked it up on tf wiki so i could be wrong i feel like that's never been revisited and uh it, to me that seems like something that would be really cool to see again so as they're walking the little green men trap the autobots and capture them and uh but not spike spike sees them they know he's human um and he tries to talk some sense into them and follows them talking to them the entire time Meanwhile, back on Cybertron, uh, the Autobots are searching for the key. Uh, we go back to this strange planet. The little green men decide they are going to blow up uh, the Autobots, even though Spike is lobbying to keep them alive when the Decepticons arrive. We find out that these little green men are the uh, Nebulans, uh, and their leader, Gort, decides to free the Autobots to fight the Decepticons. And we get another battle sequence, and the Autobots lose pretty badly here. Uh, in this fight, Snapdragon is fighting RC, and Daniel, who is with them, uh, Spike's son, uh, jumps into the fray. He gets RC free of Snapdragon, but then Snapdragon kind of bites Daniel and tosses him in the mouth and throws him, and Daniel gets seriously hurt. Uh, the Autobots decide to take the bombs that the Nebulans had planted on them and not detonated and use them on the Decepticons, but... Uh, in the process of that, the Decepticons flee, and they capture Cup, Blur, Hot Rod, Sure Shot, Point Blank, and Crosshairs. And if you know the toy line, you know exactly what's going to happen to those guys uh, in a few minutes. But we also find out that Daniel is very hurt. The remaining Autobots, Chrome Dome, Hardhead, Brainstorm, and Highbrow decide to give chase to the Decepticons, but they're stopped by machines that belong to this group called the Hive. Uh, some Nebulans follow them and tell them what those machines are, and they decide to regroup back at the Nebulan base. Daniel's alive, but he needs uh, machines to kind of live. And we find out that this machine, this life support machine, had made it into the Nebulan base, and we find out just what is the deal with the Nebulans and the Hive and the machines. The machines maintain the environment of Nebulos. Except for out here. They never come out here. But the machines are also enforcers. Wanda, look out! <laughs> enforcers for the hive. For here on Nebulos, it is the people who serve the machines. And the machines serve the hive. Ten rulers and their supreme leader, Zarek, living far under the ground. They've developed their mental powers to the point where they can control machines with their very thoughts. But their bodies have weakened and are totally useless. The machines are the hive's eyes and ears and fists. We Nebulons discovered what the hive was and we've been fighting them ever since. And... As we get another group here, we meet our Nebulans. Duros, Styler, Arcana and I are strategy. Pinpointer, Firebolt, Recoil, Haywire, Peacemaker, and Spoil Sport are our soldiers. Everyone a crack shot. You know, I always find it weird that there's that pause after Styler. Uh, I went and looked at the script, and it's all one line. You know, Duros, Styler, Arcana and I are strategy. Like, that's one sentence, and there's that weird pause, so it does sound like it's Duros, Stylor, Arcana and I are strategy. Like, it, it, it's, it's weirdly delivered or weirdly edited uh, to make it feel, sound like Arcana and Gort are the only two who are strategy. Back in the story, Spike and Brainstorm talk about Nebulans 
in Autobot bodies. We find out Cerebros is a bit of a pacifist. Uh, he's there as well, and he does not want to take part. And we get this interesting talk about Transformers Anatomy as they discuss what they're going to do. But what happens to our memories, our personalities, whenever we detach our heads from our bodies? You simply download into the auxiliary memory circuits in your chest. Now, I find it fun in this line here that the term download is actually being used properly in 1987. Um, you know, that's a word, especially from the mid-90s um, up until, I'd say, like the cell phone era. Uh, that gets misused a lot, uh, you know, downloading versus uploading. A lot of people actually didn't know what uploading was uh, back in the late 90s. Um, and I think this uh, is a great use of the word download. It's it's both literal in that they're physically moving information from their heads to their chests and, you know, more accurately figurative in that they are taking data from one place and putting it in another. Now, as they decide to do this process, RC has one request. She wants Daniel. And Spike gets us ready for what's to come. Autobots, you are about to become headmasters. And that will take us to season four, episode two, overall episode 97, The Rebirth, part two. And this one starts with the Nebulans choosing their robots. Uh, Duros takes Hardhead, Arcana takes Brainstorm, Stylor takes Chrome Dome, which leaves Gort with only one option. Oh, that leaves me with highbrow. Not my first choice, but he'll do. Now, it's interesting here that Gort, as the leader of the Nebulans, ends up with highbrow, who is essentially just um, a side character, really. Um, Gort is not nearly as important in other versions of this Headmaster story as we get into the uh, the Marvel Headmaster limited series, which came out before this. Uh, Gort is just another Nebulan. He's not the leader of the Nebulan uh, army or resistance or whatever you want to call this here. The leader has another role uh, that I will get into. I don't want to spoil this series of episodes, even though it's you know 35 years old, or other uh, episodes that we are going to do later on but just keep in mind that gort outside of this series uh has never been that important uh this is really the only time he's pretty important um and of course daniel ends up with rc so for the first time in the g1 cartoon we have a series of events here that causes autobots and a living cybertronian to merge it's weird i feel like we're a part of each other now I know. I feel it too. So the Autobot headmasters head out and they go out to practice on some hive machines by destroying them and blowing them up and punching holes in them. And the hive is now alerted. Uh, and we meet Lord Zarek observing what is going on. On Cybertron, the Autobots are fighting Abominus and uh, Prime leaves the battle to, quote, get answers. Back on the planet Nebulos, uh, the Decepticons with Scourge, are interrogating the captured Autobots. Uh, the Headmaster Autobots find the Decepticons and attack with their partners. Two Autobots are better than one, Cyclonus! You know, Cyclonus is not not a bad insult. I, I, I like it. Um, Zarak, still observing, realizes he has some plans. Back on Cybertron, Optimus Prime enters the Vector Sigma chamber to talk with Alpha Trion. And uh, this is a nice callback to the key to Vector Sigma from Season 2. Uh, Optimus Prime uses the shell of the Matrix to merge with Vector Sigma. Back on Nebulos, the Headmaster Autobots win. They free their fellow Autobots and destroy the Decepticon ship. Those Decepticons flee, and as they're wandering Nebulos, they are captured by the Hive. In the Hive base, we get the first glimpse of what would be part of Scorponok as the Decepticons land on this conveyor belt. Uh, why there's a Decepticon symbol within the Hive, who knows? But uh, they meet Zarak and the uh, other members of the Hive, and Zarak offers a deal for the Decepticons to become headmasters of their own. Now, the Decepticons are not terribly uh, willing to enter this agreement uh, and Zarek and the Hive actually torture the Decepticons before they relent but Cyclonus has a secondary counter offer just one thing you can only have the heads of the animals you'll do as I say or you'll die 
And what will you five offer us? Our weapons. You can modify them measure with the heads. So what's the difference here? <laughs> Why is it the animals that are the ones you're like, yeah, these guns, these these other ones, let's let's use them. Um, but in the process, the uh, the target masters are born for both sides, really, because this is the first we're going to see of them. Now, back in the Vector Sigma chamber, Optimus Prime uh, inside of Vector Sigma meets with Alpha Trion, and Alpha Trion reveals that organic life is unaffected by plasma energy. But hear me, Prime! A second golden age of Cybertron is almost at hand. But whether this comes to pass depends on the merging of an Autobot's life with that of a human being. How do you know this, Alpha Trion? Vector Sigma itself! It was Vector Sigma who arranged for Galvatron to learn of the key's existence. Alpha Trion? That makes no sense! Do not question Vector Sigma's motives! Man, Vector Sigma is a jerk. I mean, he's setting all these things in motion like, um, you know, let's let's hurt people to make things better. Like, dude, just let, let the world go, man. <laughs> uh, but we also find out the key must not be destroyed and on Nebulos uh, the bonding is ready but Zarek hints that he has another plan now Optimus Prime leaves for Nebulos leaves Ultra Magnus in charge on Cybertron we refer back to Nebulos where the Decepticons and the Hive bond for the first time and here we have another big roll call scene as the hive members are all uh entering their new bodies and before they are in their new bodies with the exception of zarek and one other um they're all drawn as Kranix from transformers the movie uh so it's it's a little weird seeing the hive uh in these weirdly alien robotic bodies that look like nothing like else like the people that are else in the planet it's a strange strange animation error it really is and here we get this this next group sequence where we meet the the target masters and the headmasters for the Decepticon side. Um, the Autobots, for some reason, are towing the Decepticon ship back to wherever they were going to go. I guess they were going to try to fix it. Um, they don't really explain that. I'm guessing that's something that's left over from the original five-part script. But as they're doing so, uh, they find Cerebros, and he is uh, badly damaged. He has found a city, uh, the Hive City, that we will find out about in a little bit where the grass is green and the girls are pretty. And the Decepticons then arrive uh, at this point where they're uh, in the middle of nowhere and attack the Autobots using Headmaster and Target Master uh, technology. And Brainstorm is not happy about it. Those creeps swiping my idea! I'll sue <laughs> And if you think he's not happy about that, wait till he sees the third party toys that were made of him. Now, the Autobots, uh, they join the fray. And, uh, you know, what's fun in here is that uh, Frank Welker, who is the voice of Galvatron and was the voice of Megatron, and is the voice of so many like Decepticon bad guys. He was Soundwave. Um, and he's been a few Autobots along the way. But fun hearing him as Chrome Dome lead the Autobots into a battle. Autobot Headmasters! Now, Mindwipe, because he's Mindwipe, knows Brainstorm has the key. And the Decepticons overpower Brainstorm and take the key back. But in the process of that, Brainstorm and Arcana grab Nightstick and scan him shortly before the Decepticons and the target masters and headmasters of the Decepticons uh, run off with the key. Now, Scourge wants to stay and destroy the Autobots, but Fracas strongly disagrees. No, no! We gotta get back to the Hive City! Zara commands it! Never! Not until every last Autobot is a smoking pile of rubble! I don't care about your petty feud! I obey Zarek! We go! Now! Now, it's a nice animation here because Fracas, as in his gun mode, turns around and he's floating in the air pointing at Scourge. It's kind of cool seeing um, someone's own gun being turned on them, but not with someone else grabbing it, but just being like, nope, I'm not doing that. So the Decepticons flee. And uh, the Autobots don't chase. Uh, they know the Decepticons are stranded on this planet as well. So Brainstorm has a plan. And that plan is to make Target Masters. Optimus arrives on Nebulos in his ship. And we get another group sequence as the Autobots introduce the Target Masters to Optimus. 
And with that, the Autobots plan to get the key. Now, at Hive City, the Decepticons wait for Zarek to arrive. And as they're waiting, the Autobots arrive for another fight. There's a lot of action sequences in this uh, three-parter. And Optimus sends in the Autobot Target Masters. Autobot Target Masters! Let them have it! Now, the Autobots and Decepticons fight it out once more, and RC goes after Scourge for the key. Give it to me, Scourge! Give it to me, Scourge! Give it to me, Scourge! And all the bots say I'm pretty fly for a blue guy. So with that, RC gets the key and the Autobots circle the wagons, but trouble arrives. Autobots, prepare to feel the sting of Scorponok. And thus, we get the appearance of Scorponok. Hey, want to help out this podcast or the website tfu.info? There's a number of ways you can do it. Let me tell you how. You can help us directly by joining our Patreon and enrolling as a student at Transformers University. There, you'll get early access to the podcast as well as exclusive behind-the-scenes peaks and perks for as little as $1 a month. Sign up is quick and easy. Just swing on by to www.patreon.com slash tfuinfo. Another way you can help us is by using our Amazon link, www.tfu.info slash Amazon. Type that into your browser whenever you want to shop at Amazon and a portion of what you spend will be contributed back to us. It's that easy. Finally, you don't become the world's longest running transforming toy archive without some help from other fans. We're always on the hunt for photos of figures and accessories we're missing from our pages. If you'd like to contribute, go to tfu.info slash help for a list of what we need or send an email to info at tfu.info. tfu.info, the alpha trion and omega prime of transforming toys. Now, back to the show. And that takes us to the final, final episode of the original Transformers cartoon. We're talking season four, episode three, overall episode 98, The Rebirth, part three. Once again, written by David Wise, as all of these episodes have been. And uh, it starts with Scorponok on the attack. Skullcruncher points out the target. The female one, mighty Scorponok, she has the key. So the problem having one female in the group is that it's easy to point out which one the female is. And so Scorponok captures RC and Daniel, and the Decepticons flee inside of Scorponok uh, to Cybertron. The Autobots decide they need to return to Cybertron as well, but as they're boarding the ship, Spike decides to stay with Cerebros on Nebulos. Uh, him and Optimus Prime, they have a bit of an argument, uh, but ultimately Optimus lets Spike stay. On Cybertron, the Autobots continue their fight with the Decepticons that are there, and there's a whole bunch of weird and interesting miscolorings in the animation here. We have Afterburner colored in Crosshair's colors. We have Searchlight laying on the ground in Hunger colors. And uh, eventually we have Silverbolt uh, in, so the TF Wiki says it's in Brawl colors and they think it might be Fireflight. I think it might be Silverbolt and I like to say those are Blastoff colors, uh, which would then make Blastoff's Combiner Wars toy where they use the Silverbolt mold for him <laughs> instead of making a new one right away. Uh, it would make that somewhat sort of canon, uh, but hey, you pick what you like. Now, the Combaticons, they inform Galvatron that they've finished their construction on the another side of the planet. Ultra Magnus and some more Autobots, uh, the Protectobots this time, arrive, but so does Scorponok and company. Uh, they fight off the Autobots and the Decepticons and Galvatron. Uh, they, they decide to catch up. Uh, Galvatron not too happy that the Decepticons under his command have uh, merged with organics and threatens to blow their heads off essentially uh but zarak leverages his prisoners in rc and daniel and the key and their information about the key uh as reason to not kill the hive members living in the decepticons now on nebulous spike continues to repair cerebros back on cybertron the decepticons torture daniel to get RC to give up the key, which is located inside of her stomach. Just then, Optimus Prime is visited by the ghost of Alpha Trion. The key to the 
plasma energy chamber. No harm must befall it. It is the key to a miracle. And in need of a miracle, the bots return to find uh, Cybertron isn't where they left it. The whole planet is missing. And they're not sure where it went, but they know where they could find it. And that is on the way to Earth. You find out that Galvatron has built uh, engines to move Cybertron uh, out of its orbit and towards Earth. And this is something we've seen a number of times already on things I've covered on this show, especially in like some of the smaller ancillary materials, uh, the the weird books that have been published throughout the years. And this is actually um, this is a trick that will be used again in Marvel UK down the line. What Galvatron plans to do is open the plasma energy chamber near the planet Earth. Now, back on Nebulos, Spike and Cerebros take control of this hive city that lives above ground. This is where the hive lived before they developed their mental powers. So they must have operated the machines by manual remote controls like this one, which means now I can use the machines to rebuild this city. Into what? You're going to find out, because you're going to be part of it. And just how will they be part of it? Well, we'll find out. But back on Cybertron, uh, which is now in Earth's orbit, uh, Optimus and the Autobots arrive uh, to find uh, these weird engines and Ultra Magnus and the other Autobots in in a state of almost dying. And Ultra Magnus tells of the plan to destroy Earth. Optimus fills everyone in on what's going on, how organic life uh, is the only thing that can uh, survive the plasma energy. And uh, the Nebulans, they want to destroy that key because they feel like the plasma energy could go and hit Nebulos. Uh, so they take off to destroy the key. They leave the Headmasters stuck in vehicle mode and they run uh, the Headmaster and Target Master bots uh, go to try to take on the Decepticons. They've raided their way inside of Scorponok and the Autobots uh, who are left follow uh, that trail and end up getting captured by the Decepticons. At the plasma energy chamber, Galvatron uses the key and sets up a 10-minute delay like he's setting up a timer on his cell phone. Hey Siri, set a 10-minute timer. 10 minutes, starting now. We find out that Galvatron plans to destroy the solar system after that 10 minutes is up. The Septicons, they're about to destroy Optimus and his, uh, his captured Autobots as well. Until... Decepticons... Prepare to face Fortress Maximus. Now, if you were listening closely last episode, you will know that that is the only time Fortress Maximus speaks in these three episodes and ultimately for the entire run of the G1 cartoon in the United States. Now, Spike and Cerebros, they merge. Now, Fortress Maximus, in his battle station mode, attacks the Decepticons. So here we go. We're going to have a fight between the two big bad guys. Scorponok attacks Fortress Maximus. Uh, they fight. They both transform into their robot mode. So Rebros becomes the head of Fortress Maximus. Scorponok attacks with the missiles and delivers this line. Autobots, die! I always like how he says, die! Eat, eat. There. <laughs> and he eventually gets the drop on Fort Max, but Spike uh, inside of Fort Max comes out and uh, shoots Scorponok, and then Fort Max punches Scorponok, and uh, Scorp transforms into city mode. Why? It's not really explained, but who cares? Um, from there, Cerebros shoots a hole inside of Scorponok because Spike needs to go find Daniel, and the Decepticons are pinned down by Fortress Maximus fire. Cerebros then finds uh, the Autobots, uh, Optimus and company, as the plasma energy chamber begins to open. Optimus informs Spike he is the only one who can survive the plasma energy. And Spike, he understands this. He's going to go get his son first. The Decepticons race into Scorponok as the Autobots escape. Scorponok begins to fly away as plasma energy is being released around the planet. Spike and Cerebros free Daniel and RC and find their way out of Scorponok just in time because plasma energy hits Scorponok and Sp flings him and the Decepticons into space. Space! Spike then finds Optimus Prime. Shut down plasma energy chamber! That won't stop the sun from exploding! Autobots, all gone. Up to you, Vector Sigma. Promised a miracle. 
Spike has the Nebulans get out of their armor and reverse polarity on the engines as he heads down to the plasma energy chamber. He shuts down the plasma energy chamber and brings this tube back up to the engines with a plan. We reverse that rocket's entire mechanism. Instead of putting out energy, it's going to draw it in straight to Vector Sigma. So basically what Spike is doing is the reverse space balls. It's Mega Mate. She's gone from suck to blow. And in doing that, the plasma energy is fed into Cybertron, where it already was. So I don't quite understand how the science behind this works, but it creates a new golden age of Cybertron and peace throughout Cybertron. The Autobots return to Nebulos uh, with plans to destroy the Hive and rebuild, and Prime signs Cerebros to be the guardian of Nebulos. And to finish things off in space, space. Scorponok and Galvatron, they have a plan, they have an argument, Whatever you want to call it. Silence! There is much to do. We will attack other planets. We will suck them dry. We will rebuild the planet a hundred times more powerful than Cybertron. And I will rule the galaxy! Who will rule the galaxy? Me! It is my destiny! We shall see, Galvatron. We shall see. And we, for one last time, will get wise to the game. Now, this is the last episode of the series, the last episode by uh, David Wise, who passed away uh, a little over a year ago. Uh, so, and David Wise would, would not go on to write any more um, Transformers cartoons, uh, to my knowledge. I'm pretty sure I'm right about that. I think he wrote some stuff for the convention. He might have written a comic, but... Uh, he did not write any more cartoons, so it's going to be hard to go wise to the game anymore. But we did hear, because uh, he was the story editor on Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. And so two months later, in the original TMNT series, uh, we did get this conversation between two bad guys instead of Galvatron and Zarek. Let's go talk to Shredder and Krang. Where the devil are we? <laughs> Dimension X! <laughs> no! At last, I can conquer my home dimension. But I don't want to conquer this place. I want to conquer Earth. In Dimension X, I am absolute master. You will do my bidding from now on. The Shredder takes orders from no one. We shall see, Orokosaki. And that is the end of the series. I am so happy we made it to this part of the series. For one, I, I just I'm happy that we could have covered the entire run of G1, uh, the cartoon in this podcast. Uh, two, one of the podcasts that you know inspired me to be part of the podcast community in Transformers and and to do this podcast was a show called Cybertronological, which is no longer online, uh, where they covered episode by episode the G1 cartoon and they made it up through the return of Optimus Prime um, one of the hosts passed away uh, before they could release the final three rebirth episodes and and I don't know exactly um, if they ever recorded them or whatever but um, uh, and in fact we had them on episode 50 uh, as part of our Transformers the movie coverage and it always bummed me out that that we never got to hear those those three episodes. It also kind of bummed me out that that they they didn't complete the show, and I think just as a fan of the show, I wanted to see them make it to the end. Um, so I'm glad that if you're a fan of this show, that at least I made it to the end of G1, uh, the cartoon for you. Now, if G1 cartoon is where your fandom uh, stopped, uh, and it might have stopped before <laughs> the rebirth, it might have stopped at the return of Optimus Prime. For some people, it might have stopped at the end of the the 1986 movie. Uh, I do encourage you to stick around. There's so much cool stuff in Transformers fandom. Things I learned uh, as a fan because this particular three-parter um, certainly reignited my fandom for a time. It made me hungry for more Transformers stories. Uh, so I kind of delved pretty hard into the comics after this uh, on the U.S. side. U.S. comics uh, are one of the things we cover here at Transformers University. 
Uh, but this particular episode has had a legacy into the fandom. And uh, for those of you who are newer fans or younger fans who weren't around in the early days of the fandom, um, RC as a headmaster um, had quite the legacy in the fandom, uh, particularly because of one person. Perhaps you've heard of him. His name is Don Ferguson, and he is one of the hosts of Radio Free Cybertron. And for more on his love of this episode and this series of episodes, I'm going to turn it over to Don. The thing about uh, Rebirth, uh, since we're since we're discussing the Rebirth and its importance to me, uh, is about the because I had just come off of reading uh, the four part uh, miniseries from Marvel. Marvel G1. It had just finished because it came out in July of 87. And it was over July, August. It was over about October. And then in November, the Rebirth Part 1 aired as uh, the final season on Transformers on television. And the Headmaster concept was always something that really fascinated me. It was like... And again, I, when all this was happening, I was, you know, I was born in 70. So this was, you know, 87. So I was in my late teens. And this was just a really dynamic upgrade to the storytelling where it made the humans a more integral part of the series and not just your audience affiliation characters like G prime what's going on? No, they were actually part of the war, which, which made sense to me at that point. Cause you would have humanity or nebulos involved with this because it was, it was a war for their planet. And again, this is where uh, I always thought RC uh, from the movie in season three was a really great character. And it always bugged me that she never got a toy. And even back then, I knew all the all the girl figures were always short packed. If they even got one, it, it was just. And then seeing her go through this headmaster process with a character that even back then, pre internet, pre just talking to people that I knew in the comic book stores that I went to who did not like Daniel, because Daniel was kind of the Will Wheaton before you know the the Wesley character. Nothing nothing is Will Wheaton. But I'm saying the Wesley character um, and to see him become the important and part of the story rather than just being the annoying kid sidekick as some people thought of him as coming off of that Marvel G1 series. That to me is some of the best fiction from entire the entire Marvel G1. There's a lot of good storytelling in those four issues. And seeing it kind of continued in the rebirth really just took the whole thing to a different storytelling level. And then, because it's weird because I missed the first episode of the rebirth. Because I thought after Optimus Prime in my market, it aired on Friday. I thought, okay, that's the end of the series. Monday, I was going out to do something. I remember driving to go out and do something. I thought... Oh yeah, I'll miss Transformers. It's like, nah, it's just gonna be they're gonna start over again with more than meets the eye part one. Well then Tuesday I'm home, and then it's the rebirth part two. So I had to wait for them to cycle through the entire run. On Thursday, they started with more than meets the eye. And I had to wait for them to cycle all the way back through to the rebirth part part one to see it uh broadcast. Um, but yeah, the, the rebirth is important to me because it just, it took a great concept that I love from the comic that had just ended and really made it like, if you stop and think about it, it's sort of like what Digimon would become. You've got humans and Digimon or robots working together. And then you've got a greater, you've got, like I said, the two Digimon combining as in O2. And then you've got the humans and the Digimon combining as in Tamers, which is basically your headmaster concept, you know, and just a different different flavor. So that would become an ongoing theme in other properties. But there's just a lot of parallels there for me. Uh, making making this the audience affiliation characters 
making them actually a part of what's going in in the fiction rather than just being those basic audience affiliation characters. And that's why the Rebirth is so important to me. If for all of its flaws, it is probably some of my favorite part of the G1 cartoon. Now, Don was notorious at Transformers conventions for uh, asking the Hasbro panel every year for a Headmaster RC figure. He did so in 2000. Uh, if you go back to make G1, please, please, please make a Headmaster RC with Daniel. <laughs> <laughs> he did so in 2011. Uh, I was just wondering, with, uh, with RC coming out and crying, does that, does that completely negate the fact that we're seeing a generation's RC anytime in the foreseeable future? Because, uh, I mean, I think that's a perfect line to finally fit her in without it being an animated style or the prime style. And he did so at the final official Transformers convention in 2016. Uh, is there anything on the short list you can drop that we, we might see that we haven't seen since there's a Master RC since it is the movie year? <laughs> And big shout out to everyone on YouTube that had these panels up. And of course, to my friends over at Radio Free Cybertron for that 2016 clip. The sheer irony of this all is that in 2017, as a Hascon shared exclusive as part of the Titans return line, we actually got a toy of RC with a headmaster, well, Titan master figure named uh, Lainad, L-E-I-N-A-D, which is Daniel spelled backwards. And uh, even more so, the legacy of this episode is not just that we got an RC figure with a headmaster, it's that we got RC figures in general. I honestly feel that uh, Don asking is kind of what led to uh, the first uh, BotCon 2001 exclusive uh, that had RC as a uh, toy. Uh, it was a Beast Wars uh, redeco of the Transmetal 2 Black Arachnia, but that was the first like RC and like real transforming toy uh, form in the United States that we, we ever got. And then later on, we, we've got dozens of RC figures since then. And um, it is it is no short part to uh, uh, the legacy of Rebirth. And, and yeah, I'm going to give Don credit here that this probably doesn't necessarily happen as well as it has or for as long as it has or as soon as it had uh, if he didn't keep asking the question. And, of course, if we're going to talk memories of the Rebirth, I'm going to check in with my old friend. Gabriel Owens, the Salty Seaman. Hey, folks. Uh, salty Seaman here. My memories of Rebirth. Uh, got a couple you know, pretty strong ones because I was really into the, the Masters gimmicks. Like, you know, while the line was dying, like I was getting like super into it, you know, about that year. Uh, so I was, I was very, very happy. And, and what we thought it was the beginning of, you know, season uh, four which we obviously didn't get, you know, beyond this uh, pilot and then the cancellation. Uh, uh, but uh, yeah, it was it was disappointing. Uh, but I remember, like, uh, you know, for me, it came on like I think like seven thirty or something. Like I, I literally caught the bus at seven twenty, so I, that was one I remember having to uh, record. I think I'm no, no. I, I did see the whole thing. Okay, I think I was thinking maybe I missed one. But uh, yeah, I did. End up, I ended up seeing the whole. I might have missed the middle episode. I, I just, I, and I caught it on a repeat. Like I think they replayed it like a month later or something. Regardless, but I remember, and that that was the fun of VCRs back in the day. But yeah, I had to like set it up, you know. And I think I've told before about in the living room at that time. You know, my mom like, hey, I really want to record this, and maybe something happened day two, and luckily they replayed it soon after. Regardless, I remember I ended up seeing the whole thing uh, within that month. You know, I really liked it. Uh, you know, seeing uh, the Throttlebots again. You know, I love the th I love Throttlebots. I loved Headmasters. I only had a few at the time. Like I had Chrome Dome, so I remember being disappointed he didn't get more screen time because you know that's the guy I had. Uh, you know, and uh, the, just just the whole uh, you know, the going to we got another race involved I was like okay. You know, I think the comics had already started at that point, so I kind of or the comics the comics miniseries already ran, so I kind of basically knew the story of uh, Nebulon and all that. It was interesting seeing the, you know, of course they were in an easier time bringing Spike in, you know, which I noted before. I was like, okay, well, Spike will be obviously is, is going to become, uh, you know, Cerebro's head, Fort Max head. All, all the toys were out as well, too. But, uh, you know, the, the RC thing with Daniel really caught me off guard 
because that wasn't a toy, and I, I didn't expect them to make one. I never thought, like, oh, that's they're going to put that out in the next year or anything. I was just like, I don't, somehow I just kind of knew that, like, that was just for the cartoon. Or at least, you know, it never, it, 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 the idea for it never went beyond, like, I, there was, a, like, a Chrome Dome repaint, I, I, I remember something anyway. And I, I know Headmaster Don's already all over this, so I, I will not <laughs> I'll lean too much on that other than, uh, yeah, Daniel getting... Uh, Getting thrown across the room, beat up. Pretty. That was a. Uh, I really think that was pretty. Uh, you know, shocking for that show. You know, they, they, especially with the human. Uh, maybe a little inconsistent, comparing to uh, you know how the 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 skin. You know, as before we've seen you know him and his dad like take abuse that no human being should be allowed to live from, and just get up and, and brush themselves off. But you know, when they actually show consequences for something like that, you know, I remember like, oh, that's really something. Uh, you know, I, I was, I, I liked where the show ended. I thought that was a pretty cool, you know, we're looking at a power struggle between Galvatron and Sc- Scorpinox slash Serac. You know, I, I wasn't happy with, you know, maybe, yeah, Scorpinox, there's no, uh, Scorpinox had no other personality other than Zarek. Uh, you know, Scorpinox, I, I really do like Scorpinox as a character. So that was something I would have wanted to see more of, but, uh, you know, it, it had a cool ending. Uh, but you know, I really, really was just waiting and waiting for that rest of that season to come and just, you know, eventually figured out like they got canceled <laughs> and it sucked. Or I think I read it. I think maybe, maybe they mentioned it in the comics letters page or something. I was, I finally got the word, but regardless, cause you know, when you were a kid back then you couldn't, you know, you weren't getting information about cancellations like you do these days. So sometimes the show, and sometimes the show would disappear for a long time and then just suddenly come back with like, you know, a new season out of the blue. So you never knew. But regardless, uh, that's my memory of Rebirth. Uh, I, you know, I really liked it. I was really into the whole concepts. And, uh, yeah, it was really kind of sad when it just kind of nothing else really came afterwards. All Salty Seaman has got for now. Peace. Now, one more thing I do want to get into before uh, we wrap things up is Scorponok. Uh, it's interesting here that Scorponok is kind of this bodysuit for uh, Zarak. That Scorponok doesn't really have... Uh, a mind of his own like the rest of the headmasters neither is fortress maximus really in this sense and it's kind of a unique take on scorponok and the reason i'm bringing up scorponok uh, in particular is that he's never really been written the same uh throughout transformers uh history in in the marvel comics when we meet him he is a uh he is a leader and a strong force um and he has a sense of honor to some extent um and then most recently in um the Transformers Netflix series War for Cybertron Earthrise, uh, Scorponok is kind of this um, creature that is developed by the Quintessons and scarred by the Quintessons. And in fact, I helped uh, my friend Seth Everett, host of Hall of Justice podcast, with some questions for writer Tim Sheridan. And that was one uh, that I, I pitched his way on a phone call we had. And uh, he used it. So if you go and check out Hall of Justice podcast, uh, just dropped this week, but if you're listening to this in the future, it's Hall of Justice episode 238 with writer Tim Sheridan, um, who wrote the Earthrise episode featuring Scorponok. He goes into a bit of of the thought b- process behind what that Scorponok character is, and, and uh, it's a quick plug for my friend's show, but it's also uh, neat to see that Scorponok has kind of been written in different ways uh, throughout the history of Transformers. Thanks for listening to the show. Stick around to hear what's coming up next episode. But first, I want to fill you in on a few ways you can stay in touch with the show. Want to be on the show? Leave us a voicemail at 702-763-4838. That's 702-POD-4TFU. Or send an email to info at tfu.info. Be sure to catch us on Twitter at TFU underscore info and on Facebook and Instagram under the username TFU info, all one word. Also, please subscribe to our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash TFU info, where we post all of our podcasts, plus special video segments, reviews, and live coverage of Transformers related events such as New York Toy Fair and New York Comic Con. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Please visit us at www.tfu.info, the world's longest-running transforming toy archive. And that will do it for another episode of Transformers University. Next time on the show, we're actually going to go 
back to Japan for a little bit and talk a little bit about Transformers manga and wrap up some stories around uh, the season three cast a little bit. Uh, should be a fun and wild time. Uh, I haven't read it yet, so we'll find out. But uh, last time I read the manga, we had Combaticons shooting dogs and uh, combining mini bots. So I'm hoping uh, the craziness and the weirdness holds up. So please stick around for episode 104 uh, coming up real soon. Until then, thank you for being a part of the show. Thank you for uh, being a patron, if you are one of our patrons. And thank you for sticking around uh, through all of G1. And I really do hope you stick on beyond G1 because there's so much more cool stuff as we get into what's called late G1, which is everything from here on out until uh, the early 90s. And even into uh, everything else from G2 and beyond. So I'm really excited to cover all that stuff, and I hope you take the ride with me. Until then, I am your host, Anthony Brucalli, owner-operator of Madman behind TFU.info. Until next time, see ya.